Dobry večer, everyone. Good evening, and thank you for joining us. My name is Jen Budny, and I'm the Executive Director of the Ukrainian Museum of Canada. Um, as you may know, the Ukrainian Museum of Canada is a network of museums founded in the first half of the 20th century by the Ukrainian Women's Association of Canada. Our headquarters are in Saskatoon, in Treaty 6 territory in the homeland of the Métis, and we have branches in Toronto on the traditional land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of Credit of the Credit, in Winnipeg on Treaty One territory in the heartland of the Métis, and in Edmonton, where I am tonight, uh, which like Saskatoon is in Treaty Six, and in Calgary on Treaty Seven territory, as well as in Vancouver, which is situated on the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh nations. So I'm very grateful that we're able to gather from across the country tonight over Zoom. This is the second live online lecture that we've done uh, from the Saskatoon headquarters. And we're very, very grateful to have Professor Baudin Cordan speaking to us on the political ethics and the policy and practice of World War I internment in Canada. Our talk tonight is inspired by our current exhibit at the museum, Pause and Plight by Winnipeg artist Carrie Parnell. This exhibition explores the political and social environment in which the internment camps were made acceptable, as well as the unique experiences of certain real individuals at that time. Carrie's show is supported by the Endowment Council of the Canadian First World War Internment Recognition Fund and the Shevchenko Foundation. We're grateful for their support, as well as for the ongoing support of the city of Saskatoon, SAS Culture and all of our many members and donors. Carrie's show ends on Saturday. So if you are in Saskatoon or near Saskatoon and you haven't seen this exhibition yet, I encourage you to do so. We're open from 10 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. on Saturday. Before I introduce our special guest tonight, I want to say that Professor Kodan will speak for about 30 minutes and we'll have time for questions at the end. If you do have questions, please write them in the chat box and I will read them out at the end of the presentation. And if you don't know how to find your chat box, you just go down to the bottom of your screen and there's a little uh, kind of speech bubble symbol. It says chat, you click on that and the chat, the chat will, will open up to the side of your screen and you can type in your uh, questions there. So uh, Baudin Cordan is, is a professor of international relations in the Department of Political Studies, St. Thomas More College. Prior to his appointment at STM in 1993, he held research and teaching positions at the University of Alberta from 1982 to 85, the, the University of Toronto from 1990 to 91, and McEwen University in Edmonton from 1988 to 93. He is the founding director of the Prairie Center for the Study of Ukrainian Heritage. And his current research interests include nationalism and ethnic conflict, the politics of state minority relations and Canadian foreign policy. His monographs, his books include Canada and the Ukrainian Question 1939 to 45, a study in statecraft, that's from 2001, enemy aliens, Prisoners of War, Internment in Canada During the Great War, that book is from 2002, A Bear and Impolitic Right, Internment and Ukrainian Canadian Redress from 2004, and No Free Man, Canada, The Great War and the Enemy Alien Experience 2016, and finally, Strategic Friends, Canada-Ukraine Relations from Independence to the Euromaidan from 2018. So as you can tell from that list, um, Professor Cordan is uh, one of the foremost scholars on the internment camps in Canada, and we're very, very grateful to have him here tonight. He's a friend of the museum. He's in Saskatoon, and uh, we're grateful for his ongoing support and encouragement. So with that, I'll turn the session over to him. Welcome, Baudin. Thank you very much, Jen. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you and, of course, um, friends of the museum which I, I, I take it to mean everyone who is in attendance this evening is a friend of the museum. And so it's a, an honor and a privilege. And it's a particular honor for me to speak on this particular topic uh, because uh, it has been 
a passion of mine for many decades. And, um, and I found myself um, always turning back to this issue because of its importance, not only to the Ukrainian community, but I think to Canadians generally. And so I find myself always wanting to speak about it because of its significance and its relevance, not only because of what had happened yesterday, year, because of, but because it also, I think, resonates with uh, the issues resonate with what is occurring today. So today I want to talk to, to you about the policy practice and the political ethics of First World War internment in Canada. By way of a preface, some of this is generated by sort of a number of uh, moments that I've encountered during uh, these public presentations where members of the audience would always make the claim or make the statement that you know, uh, are we not applying sort of a value system retrospectively on what had happened in history, that we we're laying down 21st century sort of ethics on the shoulders of those that in fact conducted these policies uh, with a different kind of mindset, different kind of lens, different kind of framework. And I and I was always struck by the, the need for people to often sort of excuse what had happened as somehow of uh, a different time and a different place. Right off the bat, I will say that in effect, I believe that it isn't of a different time and place, uh, that there is such a thing as moral right. And with that in mind, uh, the it is with, with that in mind that we should look at this, this story of internment and the narrative of internment and how it necessarily played itself out with the issue of ethics in mind. So without further ado, I'll begin. Shortly after the 11 November 19 armistice was signed, a group of civilian enemy aliens interned at a camp in the mountain interior of the Canadian province of British Columbia, laid out their grievances in a petition to the King's representative, the Governor General of Canada. The intent of the petition was twofold. They wished to present a statement of claim, hoping to secure the re return of seized property. Further, as an act of defiance, they sought to go on record prote protesting that their internment was unjustified and unprincipled. In their petition, the claimants argued that while the government had assured them at the start of the war they would be protected under the laws of the land and their freedoms respected, they were in fact subjected to a policy that deprived them not only of their property and rights, but liberty as well. He stated that internment was selectively used against them, not because of what they did, but because of who they were. It was a powerful indictment, especially since, as was asserted, a moral obligation had been owed them. As immigrants, Canada invite them, invited them to leave their land of birth and settle within its borders. In exchange, they were to be treated fairly. And failing to honor this commitment by interning them as prisoners of war, Canada, they argued, had betrayed them. In laying out their arguments, the, petitions, the petitioners necessarily gave attention to a baffling question. Why did the government seek to intern civilians who had been ori originally encouraged as settlers and where security, conventionally understood, did not appear to be at play? The answer, prophetically, could be found in the language of Order and Council, PC 2721, issued 28 October 1914, under the provisions of the War Measures Act. Clause seven of the ordinance, directed enemy aliens to affirm that they would abide by the laws of land and report monthly to officials as part of a monitoring regime. It also stated that without sufficient means to support themselves, aliens of enemy nationality could be interned as POWs. The order was important on many levels, but the idea that aliens originating from any enemy lands could be interned as POWs for simply being destitute was notable. According to international custom, Civilian non-combatants of enemy origin could be interned as war prisoners if they took up arms. National conscription and universal mobilization made every male of arms bearing age a conceivable combatant, and therefore large numbers were interned by almost every party to the conflict. However, the situation in Canada was qualitatively different. Internment was no longer exclusively driven by security concerns. Rather, in, in accordance with PC 2721, internment was expanded to address the joblessness and homelessness of the enemy alien. How do we account for this? At its core, the measure points to the tenuous position of recently arrived immigrants within Canadian society. In particular, the model for immigrant integration at the turn of the century was the political community. 
Through citizenship, allegiance was exchanged for societal membership. Representing a path toward belonging, citizenship, however, as a form of political identity in Canada, was still in a nascent stage of development and thus an incomplete project. Moreover, it was in competition at the time with imperial identity as an alternative paradigm of belonging. In the context of the global struggle between the British and German empires, a premium was placed on this imperial connection. This would have enormous political significance and consequences for migrants from belligerent lands. Under the imperial model, allegiance could neither be relinquished nor exchanged by subjects except at a sovereign's discretion. As imperial subjects, the loyalties of immigrants originating from lands at war were presumed as a result to lie elsewhere. Thus, they were considered adversaries. This conceptual rendering of the immigrant from belligerent lands as foes necessarily translated into the political legal category, enemy alien, as spelled out in the Royal Proclamation of 15, 15 August 1914, problematizing the relationship of these individuals to the nation while making them vulnerable during the conflict. To this end, the emergency security measures introduced under the War Measures Act, including internment, would apply, placing the enemy alien in a difficult position while testing them throughout the war. The government, however, was also tested. The Royal Proclamation and the War Measures Act made enemies of the civilian migrants who had been invited to settle the country. As a political and ethical question, should these people have been interned? The modern phenomenon of mass mobilization intimated that this was possible. Yet the war in Europe was distant and the return of enemy aliens to their homelands, even if they were reserving, could have been easily managed through tighter border controls. In this sense, the threat was neither immediate nor urgent, pointing to the fact that security was not the central issue, while also suggesting that moderation should have been exercised. Nevertheless, these were enemy aliens and internment and other measures would apply, resulting in 8,579 individuals interned and more than 80,000 reporting regularly to officials. At the heart of the problem was the place of the enemy alien in Canadian society. They did not easily or readily fit in, a difficulty that was exacerbated when problems with the economy became pervasive. The question of what to do with these people crystallized in the public's mind the issue of belonging, causing native-born Canadians to express sentiments that gave voice to their worst fears and prejudices. Public anxiety, resentment, and hostility prompted the government to act. That there were no legal protections afforded the enemy alien, a problem that followed them into internment, simply added to the conundrum of how they were to be treated. All of this, all of this had huge implications for those who had suffered the indignity and misfortune of being viewed as the other, as the outsider, raising ethical questions, not only about the practice of politics, even the way this was understood at the time, but its legacy as well, a legacy that presents us with challenges even today. The story of internment begins somewhat prosaically. It starts with the contracting economy, part of a recessionary cycle that became more acute as the country organized for war. Economic dislocation threatened workers generally and hardship became the norm. Under the circumstances, any doubts about how aliens of enemy, enemy origin were to, to be treated in the workplace were set aside. As individuals who did not belong, nativism led to their dismissal. Rising unemployment within the group convinced the government to act. The emergency powers under the War Measures Act enabled officials to address the issue of the penurious enemy alien. Order in Council PC 2721 was explicit in this regard. Those enemy aliens who are without means could be arrested, interned, and put to work as POWs. Targeting and then clearing away this vulnerable demographic as war prisoners not only meant that their joblessness would be addressed, but employment opportunities for native-born Canadians would also increase. This policy decision was startling in its import and implications. Although originally conceived as a security measure, internment quickly evolved into something other. From the very outset, there was, uh, there was uneasiness with the move. Internment was a military operation being used to deal with the everyday problem of unemployment. It led, as a result, to disingenuous statements, which sought to depict internment not only as an innocuous measure, but also one that was beneficial an action designed, so it was said, to alleviate the distress of the unemployed enemy alien. Not all, however, were persuaded by the argument. Internment was anything but anodyne. 
nor was it just another policy measure. It was an instrument of war used against civilians, and more especially against innocents, the quest consequences of which were felt by those who had no idea, absolutely no idea, why this was even happening to them. The internment of unemployed enemy aliens as POWs was a policy choice. It was also a political choice. The group, for instance, being targeted among the wider unemployment, unemployed within Canadian society. Indeed, the distinction that cast the immigrant from lands at war with the, emperor, with the British Empire as enemy aliens, making them expendable as proverbial outsiders, was central to the internment decision. But this was also possible because of public opinion to which the government was attuned. Indeed, the political inclination of the government was to observe and maintain the public interest, which meant dealing with people who, from a public perspective, were already suspect, having been legally and conceptually cast in the role of enemy. When large swaths of the public became increasingly exercised by the possible participation of the penurious enemy alien and potential disturbances, the government felt compelled to act. This worry, of course, extended to anyone who was unemployed and desperate, but the enemy alien represented a special type of risk. Indeed, public concern played out against the back backdrop of a war that was increasingly understood to be civilizational in nature. The imperial dimension of the power political conflict, Germany versus Britain, made this so. Thus, as much as it was convenient to think of enemy aliens as spies and saboteurs, and rumors were rife. In the public mind, they more, they more generally represented a threat to the civilizational order. Imperialism informed political identity in Canada and with the metropole under attack, it behooved all patriots to come to its defense. Though the war was distant, the enemy was near. Therefore, in the ongoing struggle to defend the established order, the enemy alien Canada became the focus of public fears and anxieties, including around the issue of unrest. But more importantly, enemy aliens were not the stuff on which the foundations of the country could be built. Unwanted and unwelcome, the question was asked, why were they even here? In the context of the war, the jobless, homeless, and penniless enemy alien, a civilizational threat, had to be removed. Interment indirectly provided for this. Importantly, internment could only be undertaken if there was public acceptance of the idea. The perceived civilizational threat posed by the enemy alien made this possible. Consequently, internment was con conducted openly and without compunction, compunction given public sentiment. Still, the government was careful not to indulge, indulge the unbridled passions of Canadians. Among native born Canadians, the broad call for the internment of all enemy aliens in the country, totaling some several hundreds of thousands, although disgust was unrealistic. Moreover, the problem of the jawless enemy alien was specific. Thus the government attempting to manage the problem was cautious not to yield entirely to the demands of an intolerant and hostile public. This, however, was not the case with the press, which took seriously its role as a monitor of the public interest, making clear both the nature of the, of the threat and the importance of internment in addressing the danger. The press served as an interlocutor, providing information, but also identifying and clarifying the context in which the problem of the enemy alien could be understood and assessed. Unemployment in the country was one such issue. The presence of large numbers of foreigners within the country was another. And then there's the war. For the press, the problem of the enemy alien was central to all three, a connection not difficult to make where public opinion was already primed to suspect the enemy alien. The horrors of war, the use of poison gas at Ypres, the sinking of the passenger ship Lusitania, the Zeppelin bombings of British cities all underscored the nature of the threat. The atrocities perpetrated overseas gave credence to the belief, reinforced by the press, that the conflict was civilizational. If the enemy in Europe could, could commit such heinous crimes, then surely they were capable of doing the same at home. An editorial staple of many major newspapers, the dastardly character of the enemy highlighted the immediacy of the danger and the ur urgency of interning such people. If not on ma mass, then at the very least, those who are competing for jobs with loyal patriots. To this end, Order and Council PC 1501, issued 15 June 1915, was introduced by Ottawa prompted by labor un unrest in British Columbia, 
the ordinance retroactively sanctioned the province's illegal arrest and internment of gainfully employed enemy aliens. It was an extraordinary development, declaring as it did that any enemy alien anywhere across the country competing for work, the native born could be interned. The blanket nature of the ordinance underscored the degree to which officials were willing to offer up the segment of the population to appease public opinion, whose focus began to shift from the treacherous enemy alien to the undeserving enemy alien. They were not entitled to jobs in a tight labor market, certainly not at the expense of Britishers and the native born. In British Columbia, where colonial practice was deeply entwined with issues of race, assimilation, and immigration, the anti-alien language became particularly intemperate, and the arguments regarding the future of the enemy alien unyielding. There was simply no room for such people in the province, now or ever. A position made clear or made plain in the editorials of various newspapers in the province that looked to channel the public's ire. British Columbia, however, was not alone as the press and many other major urban centers across Canada actively contributed to anti-enemy anti alien rhetoric and indeed more generally anti-immigrant discourse. No, no foreigners of any kind could be allowed to stay or let into the country. Conditions were such that the public demanded action and the government felt the need to respond that it was also the case there was very little protecting the alien of enemy origin, including those interned. At the time of the conflict, international law regarding the internment of civilians as POWs was imperfect. The laws of war held that under exceptional circumstances, espionage and insurrection, for example, civilians could be interned as war prisoners. The war convention also maintained that POWs could be used for labor purposes under certain conditions. For instance, put to work on projects unrelated to the war effort, although they could not be forced to do so. In contrast, there was no definitive international ruling on the systematic internment of groups of civilians originating from enemy lands as POWs. There was also considerable uncertainty around the treatment of such people once interned. An attempt was made to establish meaningful practice around the issue. This led to the bunning understanding that civilian prisoners and turned non-combatants would at the very least enjoy greater, greater consideration than normal captured soldiers. Despite not being wholly part of the standing corpus of international law, hence the continuing legal uncertainty, the emerging idea was that such individuals should not be used as labor, let alone compelled to work. Yet in Canada, the predicament of enemy aliens being unemployed drove the policy. They would work. And although this represented a problem from the standpoint of law, it would be squared by blurring the military civilian distinction. The POW designation legalized both their internment and work, but their status as interned civilians ensured that the laws of war relating to POWs would not apply to them. In effect, they would be compelled to work because their ambiguous status as civilian prisoners in international law allowed for this. The blurring of the military civilian distinction created a legal limbo that gave shape and direction to internment, adversely affecting the situation of the interned enemy alien. The director of internment operations questioned the legality of the operation as it was being practiced. Just Depart Justice Department officials, however, citing the military manual on war were more sanguine, stating that since such individuals, quote, were captured for military reasons, they would be treated as POWs. This, of course, was less than truthful. They were civilians, but this did not matter. They were enemies. Moreover, placed in the Canadian wilderness to work, would anyone care if no one saw? Would anyone notice if nothing was said? Indeed, when foreign office officials in London were apprised of conditions at the Bath internment camp and expressed uneasiness with what was transpiring there, given the legal implications, they advised silence, since the prisoners did not appear to complain. Prisoners, however, did protest their treatment. Moreover, some communicated the grievances to neutral diplomatic observers who were obliged to report and share their findings with the belligerent countries, setting their status as civilians. It would drive Germany to make its views known that the compulsory use of civilian prisoners, prisoner labor in Canada was unacceptable. German objections and even ultimatums were motivated in the first instance by Germany's obligation to protect its co-nationals abroad, a function of their own laws on imperial citizenship. But there was also the benefit of propaganda, a cynical ploy considering Germany's sordid treatment of civilians in the occupied territories of Belgium and Alsace-Lorraine. Nevertheless, Germany's point was well taken. The prisoners were civilians and in, 
and international st understanding, no matter how insufficient, had to be observed. Further, there was the Christian belief in mercy and charity and the moral responsibility to follow and respect the principle of natural justice. The extent of the wrong and the trying nature of internment was truly known only to those who experienced it. Life in the camps was arduous and grim. On the frontier in places such as Castle Mountain and Capus Casing, there was the relentless routine of hard labor and the harsh conditions associated with the wilderness. Brutality and abuse was widespread. This was a function of isolation, many of the camps being on the Canadian frontier, but also a result of the disregard and disdain of those who charged with overseeing the camps and guarding the internees presented their fate of having to supervise, supervise mere civilians. There was no glory in this. Accordingly, out of sight and out of mind, the civilian internees would be treated and made to feel that they were actually actual enemies. In urban internment camps set aside for first class prisoners or prisoners of an officer class, solitariness and endless boredom that accompanied the confinement also took its toll. What connected experience in both the frontier and urban camps was the widely held belief among those behind barbed wire that their internment was unjust, an idea that made the hardship especially difficult to bear. Indeed, the protest most frequently heard from the internees was that they had nothing to do with the war and therefore had no inkling as to why they were arrested and imprisoned as POWs. In an appeal to military officials after his naturalized son was interned at Banff, Jacob Condro for one stated, he could not believe that Canada would do this quote, to its own people. It was simply inconceivable to him. For those languishing behind barbed wire and forced to work under armed guard was a trial that had to be borne in quiet suffering. Their pleas were ignored. For some, however, it was too much. Succumbing to melancholy, they would tumble into the abyss of mental despair and anguish. A despondent few would take their lives, believing there was no deliverance from their torment. Others remained defiant and resisted as best they could, refusing to work, engaging in hunger strikes and riotous behavior, damaging tools, sabotaging machinery. And then there were those who gambled with their lives in a dash for freedom under a hail of bullets. Acts of desperation, the escapes, underscore the degree to which existence in the camps was no longer tolerable. Meanwhile, all of this was offset by the visits of day trekkers and the curious who came calling at the frontier sites, such as Castle Mountain. Focusing on the majesty of the mountains, they were unmoved by the hundreds of men confined behind barbed wire. And yet, why, sh why should they have been concerned? After all, those within the guarded enclosure were, were war prisoners, for how otherwise would they be there and treated this way? Similar indifference led many of the government overseers responsible for supervising the contracted work to insist schedules and quotas be met, using, using a variety of course of methods, reductions in rations, solitary confinement, beatings and threats. Prisoners were compelled to work to ensure the projects were completed. And so the byways and highways in the northern reaches of Ontario, Quebec, the mountain interior of British Columbia, and Canada's national parks were built. The, the first stage of internment would wind down when the economy improved and the demand for heavy labor by industry, including interned enemy aliens, led to the in in eventual release of thousands, notably those who were either compliant or passive during their imprisonment. Internees who demonstrated discernible dislike for authority would continue to be held. In the meantime, much had been accomplished by the prisoners, although as some wistfully maintained, more could have been done if greater discipline and pressure were applied. Still, in dealing with the original problem of the indigent enemy alien, getting them out of the way and out of sight and forcibly putting them to work, internment proved invaluable. There was a lesson in this, however. If internment could be used to tackle one problem, might it not be used to address another? For those who understood its advantages, the role of internment was rapidly reconceived. As one set of prisoners was being paroled, another smaller set quickly replaced them as political and labor unrest grew in Canada during the latter stages of the war and beyond. War protesters, radical political organizers, labor activists, anyone else identified by the police as having objectionable motives were collected under the government's war powers and sent to the remaining camps, adding to those still not released because of their truculence. Internment in this sense had, had practical utility. Used at the government's discretion to address all sorts of problems, the troubles after the war proved no exception. Internment remained in force until a treaty of peace, Versailles was finally settled 28 June 1919, the point at which the story of POWs globally would conclude. The peace accord authorized the return of war prisoners. With an agreement in place, those behind barbed wire in Canada, individuals considered detrimental to the interests of the country, 
were simply deemed objectionable, were deported under newly crafted, more robust immigra immigration legislation. To this number, other so-called undesirables were added, notably scores of the insane and, and infirm, in some cases a consequence of their internment. Herded onto ships, more than 1,000 were transported and abandoned on the shores of Europe as so much refuse, at refuse, obliged to make their way back home if they could. Meanwhile, against the clamor for the removal, a larger public discussion about post-war immigration and the need to stop the unassimilable from ever entering the country continued. Yet Canada could not deny its character as a settler country, and the petitions for a tighter immigration policy eventually dissipated with the march of time, much like the memory of the internment experience. What then is to be made of the story of internment? How is it to be understood? It is said that politics is about interest. Politics, however, is also about values. Ideally, values and interests should align, although these can be occasionally in conflict. By claiming that decisions of a particular time and place, the tension between the two is resolved. Accordingly, as is frequently said, we should not stand in judgment of the decisions that were made. History is what it is. This view, however, denies the role of human agency and the notion that choice is shaped by the human imagination, including its limitations. It is a view that further implies moral ambivalence is a normal corollary of politics where decisions must be made not to everyone's satisfaction or liking. Finally, the perspective stretches the meaning of permissibility, precluding as it does the possibility that political choices are framed by the timeless question of right. What the history of the global conflict reveals, however, is that in the realm of politics, moral considerations were at work, but simply ignored. During the conflict, the belligerents were confronted by a host of military, political, and moral dilemmas, so much so that immediately after the war, debates about rights, protections, and the lawful conduct of war, warfare arose. These discussions were not the result of an acquired, of, of an acquired knowledge of un, unanticipated wartime horrors, no. Rather, they followed from an appreciation during the war that wrongs and misdeeds were committed because of the lack of constraints and shortcomings in the law. Without adequate guidance, individuals faced moments of real moral crisis and danger. Moreover, they were left alone to make choices, underscoring what a few understood at the time, namely that decisions were not without moral content or consequences. Internment in Canada was a policy political choice. It was also a moral choice. Although a variety of factors came into play, including ideology, a hostile majority public, and an unfettered press, all producing the moral context in which decisions were to be made, it fell to government to exercise moral judgment on how best to deal with an oblique economic issue that impacted individuals who were not only civilians, but settlers that one day would become citizens of the country. When the policy of internment was adopted and these same individuals were forcibly put to work as war prisoners with no prospect of appeal or relief, a moral divide was crossed. It was a political decision that echoed in the mood of the country, the cynicism of those governments and agencies that would exploit their misfortune for gain, and the pillaring of foreigners by malevolent and intemperate press. It was a decision used against the destitute and homeless, reversed only when industry pressured government for the re their release as labor, and later applied against political opponents, protesters, and critics. All of this highlighted the opportunistic nature of government reasoning and action and brings attention to the issue of moral failure. Moral right then is a way to understand internment, it is a strand that runs throughout the entire story, the theme that binds the whole of the narrative together. Indeed, throughout the history of Canadian First World War internment, the issue of moral right reverberates with countless moments highlighting the predicament of choice. Several politicians at the time, for example, expressed concern about how internment policy was being conceived, articulated, and implemented, cautioning prudence. For them, the internment of civilian immigrants was unnecessary. It was also problematic. And although there was much uncertainty about the rights of civilian prisoners of war, as some observed, these individuals were peripheral to the conflict and therefore a different category of prisoner. They, should, they would be used as coerced labor did not sit well with them. 
Among those concerned about the course of action, the Minister of Justice, Arthur Mean, at the start of the war, strenu strenuously argued before his cabinet colleagues that there were alternatives to consider, advocating, for instance, government support for small leaseholds that would see enemy aliens work the land, thereby taking care of themselves and their families. Frank Oliver, a member of Parliament newspaper publisher, stood up in the Commons and declared the compulsory use of internee labour was something that Canadians could not subscribe to. Hoping to stave off the public's demand for mass internment and the compulsory use of their labour, another Minister of Justice, Charles Doherty, many years after internment had been in place, finally conceded that those behind Canadian barbed wire were civilians who had to be treated with greater consideration than those captured on the field of battle. Canada, he declared, should not, quote, stoop to the in inhumanity of the Hun. As senior cabinet ministers and, and as a member of the opposition, Doherty, May, and, and Oliver shared the burden of responsible government. Confronted by the requirements of leadership, they spoke out because they understood the consequence of the decisions being made and actions taken. Then there were others, others able to speak based on their special duties, who were no less discomfited by the operation of internment, its conduct and purpose. The director of internment, Major General William Otter, expressed his dismay that the military was being used to deal with local economic problems and still later wonder aloud whether Canada might be acting illegally in its use of civilian POWs as forced labor. At war's start, Canada's superintendent of immigration, W.D. Scott, was fully against designating and interning destitute enemy aliens as POWs believing that they should have been handled in the same manner as any other immigrant found in similar circumstances. They should have been provided with relief, not imprisonment. He simply could not understand how the targeting of destitute immigrants for military internment was warranted to give the ubiquity of unemployment across the country. It was not simply unfair, but unjust. Meanwhile, U.S. Consul Gebhard Wilrich, a neutral diplomatic observer tasked with reporting on conditions at the Spirit Lake internment camp in northern Quebec, and appalled by what he observed, conveyed to Washington his disbelief that Canada would do this to its own people. He asked, how was it that these individuals are being quote, treated, quote, as quasi-criminals? And what did Canada hope to gain from this? They were civilians who had shown no hostility toward the country and one day would have to be reintegrated into Canadian society. And then finally, there were the very few who in letters to the editor expressed opposition to the persistent calls for the mass internment of enemy aliens and rejected the spiteful, mo spiteful motivations and bigotry that fed such demands, claiming such utterances and impulses to be unchristian and a mark of the uncivilized. Their protests were act of, acts of courage, many being subject to public ridicule and scorn. All of these were moments of moral clarity in the darkness of war, but they also serve as points of reference and comparison Bring, bringing into stark relief the choices made and the rationale behind them. Being sec between security and lawful rule, prudence and care was needed when those decisions that affected so many were crafted and, and action undertaken. This was implicitly understood by some who appreciated the deep issues at work and the stakes involved. Theirs was a minority voice, but a voice nonetheless. History can be interpreted and misinterpreted, but the lessons remain the same. At the time, faced with policy choices, politicians, publics, governments, and their agents were forced to decide. Their decisions were framed by questions of moral right. This is the nature of politics. Indeed, the decisions made, policies adopted, actions taken, and sentiments expressed were not neutral, but had implications with real consequences for ordinary people. In this sense, there is a duty to understand as well as, as, well as the responsibility to protect and attend to the needs of the vulnerable. Furthermore, there's the obligation to uphold the principle of lawful rule. In this, there are lessons. Just as the central question of politics, moral choice, was relevant then, so it continues today. In this way, the past and present are connected. In the attempt to untangle the story of First World War in German Canada, the imperative to understand the rationale and motivations of individuals and publics looms large. These are important issues, which in their complexity, complexity need to be explored explained and discussed, but the emphasis must always be the same. How and why were choices made, the impact of which were felt by so many innocents? What does history teach us and what might we learn? 
and how might we best integrate this past into the narrative, into the story that is Canada. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Botan. That was fabulous. Um, I have a few questions and um, I'll wait for our audience also to bring up some questions in the chat, but um, uh, just the first thing, uh, something that I hadn't heard before was this thou the thousand people being shipped back to Europe um, or shipped to Europe and dropped off. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? And And it was, you know, sort of those deemed more undesirable, those who had, um, you know, with with mental health or other challenges, uh, where were they? Where were they sent? What happened to them? Well, um, at the at the end of um, at the end of the war, the, the sort of the the various sort of belligerent parties had entered into negotiations about uh, what to do with the prisoners of war and. And the argument, of course, was repatriating the prisoners of war. The problem in the case of Canada was that most of these individuals, in effect, were not captured combatants, and so they, they couldn't be repatriated. Mm -hmm. They had actually settled in the country as immigrants. Mm -hmm. So Canada was, uh, was confronted with this, this conundrum, this dilemma, which is how do you get rid of people that you do not want, but who cannot be repatriated, and so what you see at the time is the strengthening of immigration laws with a lot of the codicils associated with deportation. And so what you see at the, in 1919 is the, um, the, the government using um, uh, various uh, sections of, of immigration legislation to deport these individuals. There were some 1,000 of these individuals. Not all of them were immigrants. There were a number of individuals who had been brought from various other um, other colonies uh, that, that were uh, under colonial rule, Jamaica, Barbados, some other places as well, where enemy aliens had been sent to Canada for internment. So this was part of that 1,000. There were also captured seamen, merchant marine men that were interned in Canada, had been captured on the high seas and were interned in places such as the Citadel uh, in Nova Scotia and so on. But there were hundreds, hundreds upon hundreds, in effect, who were individuals that remained in the camps. These are individuals who had shown during the course of their internment um, intense dislike for Canadian authority, uh, showed, them, showed the, the, themselves to be um, um, belligerent, uh, and uh, and and who sort of uh, supervising um, personnel thought it best to, that the country be rid of these individuals who are just generally seen to be uh, unassimilable and potentially dangerous. Mm -hmm. And this was sort of caught up, of course, in the latter stages of the war, but also in the post-war period where you had labor troubles that um, individuals who had been arrested, especially after the Winnipeg general strike, individuals who were arrested, scores of individuals who in effect were, were um, under the uh, wartime emergency powers, which were still in effect. Um, these, these, uh, those powers would not, uh, would, not, um, would not disappear until after 1920 when the Treaty of Peace was concluded. And so we see here um, that uh, the government was able to use internment uh, as a way to deal with this problem as well. So that's part of the, the narrative. The narrative is that is the utilitarian aspect of internment that could be used to address all sorts of problems, unemployment, labor radicalism, political dissidents, um, critics, and the like. Mm -hmm. And they constituted, um, especially the latter, people who, who were, were um, opposed to Canadian authority were shown to be antagonistic as well as um, labor activists and others, these were part of the thousand that were sent. Okay, um, and, and then you talked about imperialism, and and I guess it's important to remember at this time that this you know this was this is British imperialism as it's operating in Canada through Canada, and 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 you talked about this sort of imperialist desire to 
preserve the civilizational order. And one thing I've often been confused by is is why if you know Germany itself was an enemy, um, so not only so many fewer Germans were in turn than than ethnic Ukrainians, um, but why, as we saw in our last presentation on this subject, why were Germans treated so much better in the camps than than Ukrainians? And and what does that have to do with imperialism and this civilizational order? Yeah, uh, excellent questions. Um, I, you know, sort of just a, a number of things. The nature of um, immigration to Canada. Um, uh, most of the people that came from Austro-Hungary, uh, in terms of their their class, were essentially um, working class or or um, agriculturalists um, that had left uh, left uh, Austro-Hungary. For all the obvious reasons, all the obvious reasons, um, opportunity, lack of opportunity, um, pressure on the land, and so on and so forth. Germany, entirely different. Uh, the migration to North America, both in the U.S. and Canada, had been longstanding, whereas uh, Ukrainians and other East Central Europeans came as part of the a, a de desire on the part of Canada to attract sort of homesteaders, agriculturalists who would be able to work the land. The Germans who came tended to be a sort of um, merchant class, entrepreneurs, people who were engaged in commerce. Mm -hmm. Not to say that there weren't agriculturalists, but there were a lot of individuals who, when they arrived, began to work within the various trades and so on and so forth, and opening small businesses. And with that, of course, is this idea that they were illiterate, uh, a liter illiterate cohort. And this idea of citizenship, uh, this idea of belonging to the political community became very important for these individuals who had severed ties with the homeland. Mm -hmm. This was not the case in, in Ukraine. Most, some of these people expected actually even to return to Ukraine after they had secured for themselves a modicum of wealth and so on and so forth. But having said that, this was not a priority for individuals who in effect would go to the frontier and 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 open up the land citizenship was a uh, was a sort of a a idea that was uh distant and 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 not not a, not as relevant so what we see here are these different classes of people uh, and here ethnicity and class become intertwined and and you begin to see in the context of the imperial model willingness to sort of treat the German uh, migrant, an individual who, uh, in terms of the civilizational norm, was already part of European civilization, in terms of the class origins, were in competition with the Anglo-Canadian majority, or those that in the commercial classes, a lot of them befriended them, uh, each other, and so on and so forth. So what you're seeing here is when internment comes around, there were there were, there were roughly, I'd say about 1,500, maybe 2,000 um, individuals of German ethnic origin who were in turn, they would have been enemy aliens. Those are individuals who were without citizenship, without naturalization. But more importantly, however, as, as individuals who were considered to be um, Europeans, Europeans in, in the sort of, in the, in the language of culture, um, that they would be treated differently. And so they were segregated and put into many of these urban camps, whether it was um, whether it was the Citadel, Kingston, Berlin, a number of other of these camps that were, you saw concentration. And, and internment authorities separated these, 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 these ethnic and class groups. Uh, later on, they would combine them as the move to consolidate these camps and became uh, became uh, a matter of uh, of efficiency. But for the most part, they tried to to segregate and separate these classes as well as the ethnicities. Thank you. We have a question here. Um, what about all the people who had to carry enemy alien cards and needed permission from the authorities to leave their farm or community? Can you say yes. a little bit about that? Well, you know, that was part of the monitoring regime. Uh, there were 11 
centers were uh, were individual, they were identified as registration centers. And they happened to be in, mostly in Western Canada, but elsewhere. And they, um, and they were places where individuals in these urban centers where a lot of um, enemy aliens were concentrated would have to go and register. Subsequently, um, the requirement of registering would be in, enlarged. So, um, so it would, so initially it would be in those centers and then you know, the area was, was uh, enlarged to X number of, of miles outside of those, those centers. And then subsequently it, it, it extended to, um, to uh, the rural areas. Uh, and at that point, of course, this wasn't just simply a registration with the magistrates uh, or the, in these registration centers, but rather any uh, official of the crown, uh, any could act as uh, an agent for registering these individuals. And part of their duties was in effect to ensure that um, uh, there was a constantly monitoring of their position. Uh, their whereabouts would be known, that they would be gainfully employed, uh, that they had not uh, changed their residence. Uh, so all of the kinds of things that are associated with what we would describe as a monitoring regime. But in, a, in, 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 the, in, the parla in the parlance of today's language, it was surveillance. It was, it was a surveillance regime. It was looking to see uh, who was what, doing what, where they were, and what they were up to. Um, and one of the guarantees was to ensure that were they being employed, um, did they have a residence? Did they, um, you know, their mobility, um, that they were confined, they couldn't, they couldn't move from one, you know, from one, one place to other without permission. And, and that this had to, the permission had to be um, written, uh, written permission that had to accompany them when they moved to another location, whether for employment or, or some, some such other. Um, and then uh, another question from our audience. Why, why did the Diefenbaker government order all documentation about the camps destroyed? They didn't. Uh, that's, a, that's an uh, un, un, you know, one of those, those, those rumors that, that, that have made the mill and now it's just gone on um, and taken a life of its own. Let, let me clarify this. You know, all, all of the records of internment are to be found in the archives of Canada. If you were, if you, if you wish to look, you'll find them. They're scattered everywhere, every imaginable department, every imaginable file. Um, what you do find, however, is that personnel records are lacking. Personnel records were records that were turned over to the something called the custodian of enemy alien property. And the custodian. Uh, the files of the custodian were detailed records of arrest, um, um, where they were arrested, where they were sent to, um, items that were items of property that was that was confiscated or seized. All of this was detailed in those personnel files, and these were these were essentially in the hands of the of the the um, of um, various agencies, the military in particular, um, but they were turned over to the custodian of enemy alien property. And the purpose of this was to, um, to address the questions surrounding, surrounding um, payment. These individuals had salary, uh, prisoner of war salaries that they had earned while Im imprisoned. 25 cents a day. So there were payouts that had to be made. There was also the return of property, securities, and other, other possessions, but, such as they were. And individuals could apply for these. And so the records were there. But what's important about the records is that, and the records continued. The, in fact, those files were not closed until 1952. But the importance of this is that when the files the files were turned over to the archives of Canada under Canadian law, under the, under the, the law that governs sort of the, uh, the archives of Canada. Files that pertain to personal matters, 
and this has a lot to do with privacy, privacy laws in the country, that they, they could not be turned over to, to the Archives of Canada. So they were personnel files were destroyed, but not because there was some sort of conspiracy, not because the government you know, was undertaking some kind of dastardly work to, to the effect of make, keeping the secret. It was just simply privacy laws. The mandate of the Archives of Canada, which would not accept anything that in effect detailed per, the personal affairs of, of individuals. And that even holds today. Um, um, pri privacy issues um, prevail in the context of uh, our archival, the release of archives and documents and so on and so forth. Great, thank you. Um, and then another question, um, why, why did it take until 2008 for the Canadian government to officially recognize uh, the World War I internments when the, the internments of Japanese during World War II were recognized um, much earlier? Yes, well, you know, um, there are a number of individuals who had been working on, on this question of redress for, for years, and not least of which is prior to the um, settlement with the Japanese, Japanese Canadian community, um, 1986 to be to be precise, uh, the Ukrainian Canadian community had petitioned the, the government for some kind of resolution of this longstanding uh, historical wrong. And the in the, at the time, uh, certainly by 1988, with the with the Japanese Canadian uh, redress settlement. Um, it appeared as though momentum was on the side of those who would look to see seek redress for World War I internment. But a number of factors came into play, uh, not least of which was the internal political discord within the Ukrainian Canadian community. There were uh, various voices and opinions about um, this issue of redress. Why stigmatize the community one, one more time? Why? Why, um, why bring up uh, issues that are best left uh, unsaid, unspoken because of, of the hurt and pain, but others who just simply said, just forget it, we're Canadians now and we, we, want, we want to just move on. So there was this kind of tension and discord and you see it in the context of the debates that went on in the 1980s. So the government, which was looking to see which way the wind blows simply bided their time. They weren't going to do anything until there had been some kind of consensus within the community and the community and the various communities, there was no consensus. So within the Ukrainian community, which was the leader in the, in the issue, but also amongst the various other communities, um, there, was, there, there was disagreement and, and, and discord. So it's not so much that the government uh, failed to redress this as much as there wasn't enough political will and um, momentum. And from that point of view, I, certainly I, as, a, as someone who was involved in this, saw the importance and necessity of political, of, of public education, of political education, and the need to, to do the kind of heavy lifting around, around uh, the history, uh, public presentations, this is one lecture, probably in my lifetime, I've given a thousand lectures on internment um, and have been doing this since 1988. Um, the, so, but having said that, you know, there's, um, there's reticence and reluctance on the part of government. Go government is not, is not, does not come away clean in this. And I'll just share with the audience, just a, just a kind of, in terms of an anecdote, and the anecdote was, I think, probably around 1990 or 1991, that we, we there was a redress committee of the UCC at the time, a consultation with some with the Ukrainian Canadian Civil Liberties Association, and we had went to uh, meet with parks officials in Banff, and there, and the, with the 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 intent of going through the back door and having parks officials ultimately seeing the importance of this, this episode in the development and history of the parks uh, to take it on upon themselves to actually do the kind of public awareness, uh, bringing it into some of their displays and the like. 
to to um, allow for for public memorials to be set up and the like. And in the course of the discussion, and this was the superintendent of Banff National Park, took me aside privately, and he basically said to me, uh, "If you actually think that Parks Canada is going to do this, you're nuts." Um, and part of it, he said, is currently at the time in 1990 was there was a commission traveling Japan um, looking to um, ensure that those who had claims against the government of Canada, their descendants, uh, would uh, were would be made aware that that um, that they could avail themselves of the services of the government and the like. And his comment to me was simple, which is, if you think that we will publicize that Canada not only interned Japanese Canadians, but it has the habit of interning other peoples in this country, then you're mistaken. He says, for us to go and, and begin to do this kind of work while commission goes around Japan and people are suddenly realize that not only did we do this to the Japanese, but we've done it to other people. He says, this is not, this is, you, hell will freeze over before that happens. Well, I but, guess hell does freeze over because yeah. um, it did happen. Yeah, you got it done. Yeah, yeah. And so when did that happen? And in what form did it take? Well, uh, in terms of Banff National Park, which is the jewel of the crown in Canada's national park system, they erected a building. The building is a small museum display, title of which is Enemy Aliens Prisoners of War on the tablet in front of it. Um, and um, um, this, um, this museum uh, building, in fact, if I recall correctly, is the first public structure built in Banff National Park since the 1930s. Um, and I believe that, you know, um, others could help me on this, but I believe that it was erected um, 2008, 2010, some, somewhere thereabouts, about a dozen years ago. Andrea, Andrea yeah, Mollish was on the note. Yeah. Oh, you're muted, Andrea. We'll just unmute you and then you can set, there we go. Go ahead, Andrea. Sorry, 2013. 2013. So During that's... the floods, we tried to erect it, to open it up officially in June. And then the floods happened in Canmore and Banff. And we ended up officially doing it in, with Jason Kenny in September of 2013. 2013 yeah. But it took us two and a half years with negotiations with the Parks Canada historians to uh, agree to the uh, text that's included. And of course, the historians of parks did not want to agree to our terms with the text. It's quite whitewashed story. Hmm. Just to add to, to add to Andrea's remarks, just to add to Andrea's remarks that there was considerable difficulty about the language that would be used, and so uh, the uh, in order to deflect some of the criticism that would be aimed at uh, government responsibility, because at the time the argument really is that there wouldn't be an apology would not be offered, that um, there would be an acknowledgement. Of wrongdoing, but no apology, and so they were careful to ensure that the language that would would be uh, that would be displayed would not reflect any kind of culpability or responsibility on the part of the government. So, Parks Canada um, brought its own gang of historians, many of whom I know, and then the Canadian Canadian community brought me as as the uh, for as the witness for the defense. And and do they had historians, but do they also have lawyers parsing the language? No, no, it's just some lawyers. Uh, okay. Jonathan Vance, Bill Weiser. Okay. The, okay. For the Ukrainian, Interesting. The Ukrainian community. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, so um, uh, two two other questions. We're at seven o five or eight o five now. Um, so uh, you mentioned early on that this story. Um, continues to pose challenges today in some ways. And, and could you maybe elaborate on, on what those challenges are as you see them? 
you know, uh, the challenge, I, I've, I've tried to make the case. So the, 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 the line, the story of internment is always about, um, about sort of the grim reality of what had happened. But let us remember that this, that this was not sort of the cruelty of war, however one might describe it, that this is something to do with, with things that are completely out of our hands. These were political decisions. But as I've tried to frame it, is that every decision that's made is also a, a decision with moral consequences that has that it has moral content to it. Mm -hmm. That's politics in general, if that's the case, is that it is ultimately uh, it operates in the realm of political morality. It's not an accident that, you know, you know, we talk about politics and we say the teaching of politics, we describe it as a science. It's anything but a science. Mm -hmm. There is no such thing as political science. You know, uh, political science is a function of, you know, the kind of Americanization of politics with the idea of sort of behavioralism and the kinds of social sciences that came into play in the 19, you know, 50s and 60s and so on and so forth. You know, the black box, input, output, so on and so forth. I, I was also, so happy to hear you saying this, but yeah, it has I, nothing to, it has scientists nothing to do often with... start off their sentence, start off their opinions by saying, as a political scientist, and then yeah, they go, no, no, no. <laughs> you know, what's so extraordinary is that politics, for example, in the Sorbonne, is often uh, coupled with religion. And mm -hmm. in fact, it's in the faculty of moral sciences. Oh, wow. Politics. Mm -hmm. yeah. Science is about value, or rather, politics is about values. Mm. It's about choices, but choices that are, that are grounded in values. And so when you ask that question, what, you know, what relevance does this have? It's because the, that these are, these are political decisions that we made at that time under very trying circumstances. Don't get me wrong. You know, it's very difficult for politicians to, to, to thread, that, thread that needle. Um, it's, you know, it's the, you know, the... What's that, that phrase, you know, the eye, eye of the camel, you know, the needle through the eye of the camel. To, but, and so it's very difficult, but, but I don't think as long as you hold on to the truth, as long as you hold on to um, principle about such things as the common good, as um, the impact of these, uh, these decisions on the private lives of individuals, who in effect, you know, wants nothing more than what you want. Nothing more than what you want. And in this sense, the basics of, you know, freedom, liberty, mm -hmm. um, um, jobs, so on and so forth. And when we begin to understand that, then what we do today is no different than what they did and what they should have been understood then and they did understand but some they chose to ignore is the same kinds of predicaments we are today but you choose to ignore it well we do see the same arguments used sometimes when we look back at other kind of um uh you know imperial approaches to to nation building in canada which is like the residential schools mm -hmm. this idea that well people didn't know any better when in fact just as you're pointing out with the with the story of the internment camps there were plenty of people around at the time who were pointing out that it was wrong. And yet, you know, it was clouded by other things, which are no notions of civilization, yeah. uh, civilizational yeah. notions and so on and so forth. But these were all constructs that allowed them to explain away whatever they wanted to explain. But, yeah. at the, but, but it didn't, it didn't um, belie their obligation and responsibility to treat people fairly, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. treat people as they were, knowing full well, you know, that we all come in different sizes, shapes, yeah. colors, um, um, perspectives, mm -hmm. uh, cultural cultural underpinnings, and so on. Keeping that in mind, when we begin to see the importance, the need to be respectful, to be cautious and prudent in what you do and what you say and and what you and and, and, and the decisions and policies that you craft, these things would not happen. Yeah things simply would not happen. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so um, two, two last things that I'll combine into one. Um, do you have, could you point out any more resources for somebody who's interested in learning more about redress? 
and um and and maybe the whole process that went on during that time of the you know the conflict within the Ukrainian community trying to to get this recognized by government where could one turn to to learn more about that and and then the other request is would you be willing to make this pa the the paper that you were speaking from tonight available to our audience because somebody would like to read it before this um, recorded talk goes up online okay um so uh, I would ask uh, for those who are interested in knowing more about internment and and even redress, there is a um, website, the Canadian First World War Internment uh, Recognition Fund. Um, uh, perhaps maybe you could post, you know, the link uh, if it's all possible. Um, and it has, it's, it's, it's full of information, a lot of uh, important, um, impo important, um, uh, important uh, declarations, announcements, uh, and even archival material that allows people to to delve into this. Um, there are published papers that are on the, that website, um, and of course, a literature literature that uh, that has been identified, and you can you can easily easily access, or most of it you can access uh, through the library system, university or public library system. Um, or online. So I would encourage everyone to look at that uh, at that link. Tooting my own ho horn, uh, I wrote a book on redress uh, published in 2004, uh, Barren Politic Right, uh, Barren Politic, what was it? Barren, a Barren Politic Right, uh, Internment and Redress and Ukrainian Canadian Redress, published by McGill Queen's University Press in 19. In 2000 and 2004, and so it outlines a lot. Outlines sort of this is prior to the actual uh, redress being concluded. So it's so so it's with the expectation that redress redress would be would be concluded, but it was at that when I wrote it, it was open ended, and so the 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 book really lays out some of the philosophical theoretical. And historical arguments for redress. So, um, and that too is available. As for this paper, well, 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 well. Okay, so um, I have a collection of essays uh, that I'm negotiating currently with a publisher um, that outlines um, these various arguments. So this this paper is an overview of those those arguments. And um, that book may very well appear either in late 2023 or early 2024. I'm hoping because um, I've shared this paper with some people and they've also said, wow, this would uh, be good to have this on file somewhere. Um, and so I'm hoping to have it published as an essay, not a, but in, in a book format probably within the next two or three months. And that will be made, be made available for purchase. Um, so it'll be a special issue, a special edition, maybe 200 copies or so that will be put in libraries. And it's just simply for the purpose of having one more brick on the wall, um, one more item for students and the interested public to turn to uh, so, that, so that it might help them understand the deep issues at work. So, so, so the that's a that's a very nice way of of saying no. You can't have the paper now before this. this no, <laughs> so online. so what'll happen? So we'll try to get this up online really soon. Yeah. So you can, I promise so the book will be again. reaching. Um, yeah. but, uh, but it'll be available in a couple of months. Thank you, Bodan. So, so um, with that, I think everyone will join me in um, offering their applause to you tonight for a wonderful lecture. Uh, that was that was really great, and I'm I'm grateful to to have received so many questions from the audience and and had had such a good turnout. Um, before we go, um, I do want to remind everyone that Carrie Parnell's exhibition ends on Saturday. So if you are in Saskatoon or near Saskatoon, please come in before. Saturday at 4.30 p.m. to see that show. 
And for those of you in Saskatoon, tomorrow night at the museum at 7 p.m., we're screening Mustache Funk, which is a, a Ukrainian documentary about one of the brightest periods of Ukrainian pop music. That's the 1970s with all the mustaches. And um, that's at the museum at 7 p.m. And, and then on Tuesday, February 28th, we're opening a week-long exhibition in partnership with Saskatoon UCC of photojournalism from the last year in Ukraine to mark the one-year anniversary of Russia's full-scale assault on Ukraine. There will be an opening reception on Tuesday at 7 p.m. and a closing reception and public talk on Saturday, March 4th at 1 p.m. The talk is by Vladimir Ternovsky, an agricultural economist from Odessa who arrived in Saskatoon last year. And he's going to talk about the early days of the war as he experienced it and, and his friends and family experienced it, as well as the impact of the war on Ukraine's agriculture, which as we know is one of the issues at the heart of Russian imperialism. Um, and so uh, with that, um, please check our website and take out a membership if you're not a member now and you'll get all of these announcements delivered to your inboxes. Um, I want to thank Professor Cordan once again for his wonderful lecture and I thank all of you for joining us here tonight. Um, hope to see you next time. Keep your eyes uh, on, on our website for our next online lecture. Don't know when that's gonna be yet or what it is, but it'll happen soon. So diakoyo. Good night, everybody. Right.